Him. And I want to talk about why I believe that there is a usurpation. The idea means to steal or to fraud or to unlawfully take the place of uh, the name of God or the reputation of God or the the fame of God. That's what I want to talk about. And then we want to kind of consummate our study on the Cain or the grace of God in Noah's life. So um, there are going to be a couple of questions that I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to pose to you guys. Maybe you guys can join in the, the question. The first question that I want you to think about is... Um, what do you think, and, and you're going to have to think this one through, you can do this as we are working through the text, what do you think would be probable experiences on the part of Noah and his family for uh, the hundred years that he was engaged in building the ark? I want you to think this one through, uh, and I want you to think it through carefully, try to be as rational as possible, you know, I don't, <clears throat> I don't do well with lack of rational thinking. Uh, what, and then I want you to think of one or two things. That way we can have some, some dialogue. You might come up with five. I have several things that I think hypothetically or plausibly speaking, what Noah would have went through for a hundred years as he was given an assignment by God to do something for which the world would not, uh, they would not appreciate. For a hundred years, Noah will be walking contrary to the world in a very vivid way, in a very uh, visceral, visceral way, in a very uh, particular way. And I want us to put our feet in his shoes and think through why it is that God honored Noah for doing that and what, and what kind of grace did he have to have over against the world that is described in Genesis 6. We're going to touch on that a little bit. So I want you to think about it because once it's Q&A time, I don't want you to necessarily be searching, although I think if we have uh, some help in our study, you will probably pick up more observations throughout our, our study today. Um, the other question that I'm going to be uh, basically raising is around the idea of, of on the side of his, uh, his, what I would call opponents, the world that he was in, what do, you, what do you think, and you might know it by experience, maybe not, I hope you do, what do you think it is like to be confronted with truth claims that, uh, that, that repeatedly bump against your conscious, against your life on an everyday basis, and probably will spend the totality of your life and those truth claims are claims that you neither want to affirm, neither want to affirm, or um, don't have the ability to refute. I want you to think about that with me, because what I want us to do is appreciate the tension of the narrative. You know that's what we do, because otherwise you won't appreciate the gospel if the narrative is too shallow in your thinking. So there are two groups of people in Genesis 6 through 9 that I want you to think about, and I want you to try to put your feet in their shoes so that when we go into Q&A, we can have a healthy Q&A. The first one is, and you guys in the, uh, in the live stream audience can follow this along with us as well. The first one is, what do you think would be plausibly or high probability uh, experiences on the part of Noah and his family to be engaged in the mission that they're in that would last them a generation, uh, a century in their mission. What would be some of the things he would have experienced? His wife would have experienced, his three sons would have experienced, and his daughter-in-laws would have experienced over a hundred year period of them walking contrary to the world. That's one set of thoughts we want to touch on when we get to Q&A. The other set of thoughts then is on the side of the people who have to live with Noah uh, because Noah is in the center of their life and Noah's mission is to actually tell the world they're going the wrong way and the world has to actually bear up under uh, a truth claim for a long period of time 
And that truth claim is going to incrementally grow and expand and almost become unavoidably persistently present in their life. What would it feel like to be the kind of person who has been confronted with truth for which you have no desire to affirm, even though it's constantly there, and no ability to refute, or, or not even a willingness to legitimately refute it. Did, that, did those questions make some, some sense to you guys? All right, so I, I want to leave that alone now, open in prayer, go through our text. And when we get on the side of the q and A, I I don't want us just sitting there with our screens with the little blue circle going, <laughs> because you and I should be thinking people, right? right? We should be thinking people. We should be thinking people. Remember, I, I really want our studies to be <clears throat> studies that require active thinking. So they will come. So, Father, thank you for your mercy and your kindness. Thank you for the group of people coming out to class tonight. Thank you for those online. As we go into your word, we're asking that you open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds, and really help us to be able to see the gravity, the beauty, the complexity, the paradoxical, and yet at the same time, wonderful expectation of people whom you have put your hand on to show the world that they're going in the wrong direction and what that looks like. Help us to see in it the glorious work of Jesus Christ in a substantial way, not just a theoretical or abstract way, but in a very substantial way, help us to see Christ in our text as well. And what that would mean, Lord, that you would have to illuminate our heart. Help us to focus, help us to pay attention and, and grant us that clarity. Remember the word unto your servant upon which you have caused us to hope. This is our comfort and our affliction because your word has quickened us. We pray for every house represented here, every home, every family, every extended family. We pray for the body of Christ around the world in her needs and in her calling. This we ask on the grounds of him who shed his blood for us to cleanse us, purge us, sanctify us, and grow us. And on the grounds of him who is our righteousness, which allows us to stand before you accepted in the beloved. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in Genesis chapter uh, 6, I want us to revisit, revisit a few things that God said. I'm going to start maybe at verse 5 and then go through verse 11. Uh, and and that, that then we'll pick up on our, our fourth point, which will be the Hashem, the name, the name, the reputation, the name, the name and reputation. So I'm at verse five. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Thus is the reading of God's word. The questions that I pose before you, those of you who heard it on the inside, two sides of the question that we're going to get into in about 45 minutes to an hour on the part of Noah. What are some of the high probability or plausible experiences that he may have, his family may have confronted with the kind of missional task that he was engaged in? Um, one or two thoughts so that we can cover a gamut. What would that have been like for Noah to be on a mission that was operating almost diametrically opposed to the totality of the context in which he lived in 
And, and this was talked about by, by Christ, as you know, in Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. I want you guys to, guys to reason that through. I'm going to give you some material as we unpack these last two points on that. On the other hand, I want you to think about the people in that context as well, for whom they were confronted with truth and facts, claims about God and his purpose and will, in reality, for which they had no uh, desire to affirm it, nor did they have any ability to refute it. What must have been going on in their heart and in their mind and in their soul under that kind of tension? Does that make some sense? All right, good. All right. So the first thing I want to say as we are making our way through has to do with point number four, having come all the way through Elohim, the sons of Elohim, Nephilim, the giants, the gibberim, the fame or the um, notoriety, which is also where we are in our notion. That's point number three, the gibberim, the destructive power of this trio um, brought about what I would call in uh, verse four. A fame. Notice what it says at the end of verse four of chapter six, uh, in verse four, the totality to get to this point. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of what? Right. Men of renown and really is the term fame, men of fame. And it was really the term men who had or possessed a name, men who had or possessed a name. This becomes one of the colloquial uh, uh, terms of uh, he was famous. He made a what for himself, a name for himself. That's what we want to get out of that word name. There are a lot of meanings behind the word name, but this one really is about reputation. It's about fame. It's about character. It's about a history of behavior that left for you a legacy. That's what that term means. OK, so and then remember, it's couched in the context of God's utter displeasure. So we don't want to lift up this concept of renown or fame and miss its context. Whatever one might think about being renowned or one might think about being famous or having a reputation, if God has been looking upon it and you and has determined to wipe it out, that fame means nothing. So I want to make sure you get that because I'm going to contextualize it and it's going to make sense. I actually understand a bit of the grammar, so I know why God is playing with the term Hashim here. But I believe that when God lays out in this context that these thugs, these marauders, these crooks, these, um, these, these, um, these bullies, these powerful uh, individuals who are simply going about uh, wreaking havoc on the life of people, destroying the land, uh, functioning with a, an influence that caused all men in that time to have evil thoughts. Because you got to understand that you got this cadre, you got this cadre of people who are actually influencing society. Y'all understand the narrative, right? So you got this system, this cadre, this cabal of people influencing society, and we just read the narrative. They're not thinking God's thoughts after them. They're not obeying God. They're not loving God. Every imagination of the heart of mankind was only evil continually. That means this cabal had the ability to influence society on a negative level. So, see, that's why hearing what God said about it is important to the narrative. Because God's going to get it right, isn't he? God's getting it right. God is saying, when I look at these famous men, these giants, and then I look at the whole world, what I realize is these people are doing evil. Their thoughts, the idea of imagination over in, uh, in, verse, uh, in verse five, the imagination of their heart was only evil continually. It's not just the way they were thinking. That word imagination means plans. It means schemes. It means ideas. Their goals were evil. Their plans were evil. Their schemes were evil. And you have to know this. 
uh, as we see it over in verse 9, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole of the earth, beholding the good and the evil. So the narrative wants you as a child of God to understand that God sees everything. He sees his people and he sees those who are not his people. He sees what we do and he sees what we think. He sees what we say. He sees the intents of our heart. You have to have that kind of underlying understanding of the narrative or you're not ready to do theology. Am I helping you? Right. You have to say, God, that's why I pray. Open my eyes. Because if you're reading at a surface level, you are missing theology. Theology is not just reading a narrative and maybe going away with a bit of an understanding of the horizontal context. Theology is always being able to see the narrative in the light of who God is. Theology is seeing the narrative in the light of who God is. When you and I are doing theology, we are thinking God's thoughts after him. If we're not thinking God's thoughts, then we're reading into the text human interpretation, human assumptions. And at that point, we're not going to have depth. So what was really important about the Genesis 6 narrative is God is talking to us, telling us how he sees it. That don't require anything but really paying attention to how God saw it. We don't have to really do a lot of interpretation. God just told us things are so bad that he had to pull Noah aside. Hey, Noah, come here. I'm getting ready to clean house. And I'm just letting you know. And it's going to be 100 years. And what I need you to do is actually function on my behalf as a witness to the world that these things are not going to continue in perpetuity. Y'all got that? All right, so that's very important. Now, here's my argument. Uh, okay, yeah, that's verse eight. My argument is that when we saw in verse uh, four that they made a name for themselves, that they made a name for themselves, that this making a name for themselves or a fame or a reputation was something that was dishonorable to God. Would that be a plausible interpretation? All right, so now I want you to go to Genesis chapter 11 because here in Genesis chapter 11, is the second set of recapitulation principle factors. So while you're going there and while she pulls it up, Genesis 11, we're going to go through the first seven or eight verses. What do I mean by recapitulation? So when something recapitulates, it repeats over again what it had done the first time. Only the second time it does it, it does it slightly differently. And the third time it does it, it does it slightly differently than the second and the first. But there's enough of a correlation between the prior acts and the present act that we know we're dealing with recapitulation. Does that make sense? Like when Abraham got tempted to go down to uh, to um, Egypt and he told Sarah, I need you to say to them that you are my sister and not my wife. That was recapitulated by Isaac and Rebecca. Remember, I told you that the Genesis 6 narrative, verses 1 through 4, was a recapitulation of the Genesis 3 narrative where Adam and Eve fell. You guys remember that? That's a hermeneutical principle to help you do what we call a spiral historical interpretation. Spiraling is when the present is connected to the future. The present is connected to the future, as is the present is connected to the past. So even when you move forward, you're moving forward with strands, DNA of the past. Y'all got that? Like in our life is like that as a whole. Like you don't have a future without the present, but you don't have the present without the past. Y'all got that? It's important to know how that works. These are fundamentals in what is called teleology, the progression of things. So here in chapter 11 is another time when humanity is going to act a fool and then God has to interrupt. So Adam and Eve acted a fool. God interrupted. In the days of Noah, humanity acted a fool. What is God going to do? Interrupt. Here we are in chapter 11, and humanity is getting ready to act a fool again. So then what does God have to do? Interrupt. 
because God is sovereign. He has to deal with the irresponsibility of human beings. And I'm going to show you the correlation between the Hashem, the renown in chapter 6, and the, the thing that's going on in the mind of human beings in chapter 11. And you're going to see the corollary. And then I'm going to give you the explicit uh, hinge pin that ties it together. Chapter 11, verses 1. And we'll go down to verse uh, 9. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Shinar is Babylon. It's Iraq. Just want you to give, a, give you a, a sort of a geographical or topographical context, okay? And, and you could imagine if you wanted to, if you had a map there. I shouldn't do this, but I'm doing it just in case it can help you. If you could imagine that if you had a map of the Middle East and you recognize that the Tower of Babel event is occurring in Babylon, if the text tells us they came from the east, then you could actually trace a kind of trajectory as to where they came from. Because we're coming from Noah and the flood and wiping out the earth and starting all over again with the three boys and their kids and them creating nations out of that family. Y'all got that? So we can we can surmise where they came from if we want to. We can even surmise where the Garden of Eden was in a very general sense, although we have to be careful because there was a uh, there was an earthquake that split the land up, too. But we could still surmise what it means to come from the east. So now notice it says in verse three, and they said one to another, go to now, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they have brick for stone and slime they have for martyr. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. This is like the skyscraper stuff, right? This is what they're talking about. So in a really interesting way, what you have to know about the Bible is that the Bible is always teaching from a premise of history. That's the role of the Holy Ghost. All teachers can actually only teach present and future op, uh, possibilities on the premise of history. Y'all got that? All teachers. Parents can't teach their children the future without knowing the past. Nothing of the future is taught without knowing the present in its relationship to the past, because the future is always hypothetical, but it's substantiated by the present if it's logical and possible. But the present is a byproduct of the what? So good teachers are always taking you backwards to help you understand where you are and to move you forward. So the goal of the Holy Ghost is to take a history book. His story and help you understand the past so you can know where you are in the present so you can be sure about the what? That's exactly right. All teaching is always that way. You won't ever have a teacher that's wholly telling you about future things without him constantly or her constantly making reference to the present and the past. The best teachers now to take past material and actually project hypotheses for the future. And that's what your Bible does. I make that observation because here we are some 5,000 years almost, maybe four, uh, 4,000 years, 3,000 years before Jesus, Genesis chapter 11. 3,000 years, 5,000 years from us in this narrative. That's a long time ago, wasn't it? And they are already talking skyscrapers. You need to be sensitive to that. You need to be able to understand that your Bible is able to encompass the totality of human thought within the narrative of Scripture, no matter how boastful mankind will project and hypothesize and, 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 and if you will, uh, speculate about what he can do in this world or on other planets, et cetera, et cetera. You will find the Bible being able to speak to it because the Bible is God's word. Does that make some sense? Now, it'll do it in primitive terms. It'll do it in historically uh, confined narratives, but you can make the carryover. This here is about a skyscraper hitting the clouds, even in the earliest days of humanity. Nothing new under the sun, right? 
So now notice what he goes on to say in verse 5. And the Lord came down. You remember what we said about anthropomorphical acts? Who's coming down then? Jesus. Right? Jesus is always the visible Yahweh functioning in the what we call pre-incarnate manifestation of the God man who's moving about on the behalf of his father. Y'all got that? So the Lord came down in order to see the city and the tower which the children of men did build. Okay, since I have you for a little while, this simply is, again, the accommodation of anthropomorphism that basically says that God pays attention to man's plans and God will search them out as any wo anyone would whose interest is in the welfare of humanity and recognizes as a group of knuckleheads that's intending on doing something that may not be in the best interest of everybody else. Y'all keeping up with me? Right. And, and so you want to be able to thank God for anthropomorphism because it is so accustomed to who we are. And it teaches us about how we are to be if we're human beings in power. Let's say you ran a company. And if you're going to be diligent about your company, you better know what your employees are up to. You better be careful to know if there's little groups, little cabals, little balkanized uh, uh, tyrants or rebels in there trying to take over your company. Anybody that owns any property is going to, from time to time, exercise what we call resident lordship. And I already told you the third person is the resident lord in the temple of our bodies, is he not? Is not the Holy Ghost the resident Lord Jesus? He's called the Spirit of Christ. So he hangs out with you in real time to make sure you don't get up after the fool one day talking about doing something crazy and you hadn't got permission from God. I'm just trying to help you understand how God works. OK, and, and this will easily emerge to be the case. So God comes down. You know, look at these. Look at these knuckleheads. I'm not going to use the word fool too many times, um, but it's often a good word because what they're doing here is acting like. God doesn't exist. Now, you and I are only three chapters away from the flood. Chapter seven and chapter eight wiped them out. We're only three chapters away and they're acting a fool again. You see how quick human beings forget God's hand of discipline. You remember growing up? Uh, if you ever got your butt whooped like I did. For about five minutes, I was cool. After that, I was back at it again. I remember saying to myself frequently as I'm going out to do my dirt, Jess, what you doing, man? Right? I used to go, this is crazy. Like, why am I engaging in something I know going to have a bad outcome again? Now, this is called the mystery of iniquity, whether you know it or not. Sin is a mystery, isn't it? Because it's not rational. Right? It's prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I own. Right? So it's not, it's not rational for you and I to have a good God who loves us and tell us don't do what we do. And then we do what we do, even though he tell us don't do what we do. That's not rational. And it's not rational when you have good parents that are trying to give you boundaries so you can be safe and you want to jump the fence. That's the nature of sin, and your Bible will let you know how human beings are. This is why we got to be careful about those who rule over us, and I press this home all the time. The notion that somehow we can just carte blanche trust our rulers is unbiblical. Y'all got that? Your ruler is no different than you and me, except by orders of magnitude, ten times more capable of destroying human beings and making a mess. So we have to hold them accountable, which is what God is doing here. Accountability. Y'all see that? That's when the landlord shows up and knocks on the door of us who were renters. When the landlord shows up and knocks on the door of those of us who are renters, guess what we're reminded of, Big D? We don't own nothing. God owns it. And he has a right anytime he wants to to show up and just make sure that we weren't burning the house down. Because we sure enough could, couldn't we? We could just burn the house down like they, there's nobody on this. This is mine. 
That's how delusional we are. And this is where humanity is today. They're under the delusion they can do whatever they want to and don't have to answer to God. All right, let me keep it going because I needed to I needed to massage your thoughts because I want you to get it as we make our way to Noah. So we read over in verse <clears throat> verse five. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men did build. And the Lord said, behold, the people is what? One. And I want, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And they have all one language. And this they are beginning to do. And now nothing will restrain them from that which they have imagined to do. So here again is such a parallelism to where we are in our present world. So there is a unity. There is a set of agreements. There is a oneness on the part of this present world system that corresponds to the notion and idea of globalism. They are almost at the point of what many of us understand in artificial intelligence as singularity. Who knows the doctrine of singularity in here? I know you do, Mark, raise your hand. How many of you guys understand the doctrine of singularity? If you don't, you need to. Because the singularity doctrine is the systematic, incremental, uh, and relentless um, agenda on the part of the powers of the world to subsume everything under its control so that there is one single blockchain power governing everything. Did y'all get that? So I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that even within the, even within the parameters of God and his providence, allowing us have windows, having windows of space to live and to, to move and to do things that we do. I, I want you to get this because your Bible talked about and, 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 and for one hour, they will be given power as one to make war with the saint. That's Revelation 17, uh, verse uh, 11 through 14. We talked about that many times. The, the 10 horns will exercise power as one for one hour. And that term one hour is not literal, it's symbolic of a crucial period of time when all of the powers have united as one in a blockchain of authority over humanity. Y'all getting that? Right. This is why almost in every system that occurs uh, in terms of business, that the goal is that business grows and becomes so large that it swallows up every other autonomous system. Y'all got that? And that's intentional to go around and swallow up everything to the point where there's only a handful of power brokers operating out of a blockchain to control everything so that at some point singularity is achieved. Now, what is singularity? The inability of anyone to operate independent of the larger agenda or what we call the global agenda. Y'all got that? Right. So right here in Genesis 11, you and I are given insight into the objective of fallen man to take on this goal of being able to control the whole world. Y'all got it? Very important for you to get. Very important for you to get. Very important. And here is what you need to know, that the model of global singularity is really a uh, paradigm of who God is in absolute control over everything. So you got an antichrist system trying to be like God to rule over everything and have all of it subsumed up under him. Am I making some sense? All right, I could go deeper, but I want to make sure I advance into our study for tonight because it's important. I really want to start a new chapter on Tuesday. So here's what God says. If they achieve singularity, if they are able to actually bring about one language, uh, one, uh, one mindset, one, one system of thinking, nothing on the earth will be able to stop them from achieving their goal. Now, what I did right there was what, what is called in part a, an elliptic assumption. Because if you look at the language, here's what it says. And now, the latter part, and now nothing will be restrained from them. Do you see that? Yes. Nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Now, of course, we're talking about God. God's not saying that they're going to be so powerful that I can't stop them. I just wanted to make sure you understand that. Because the moment you buy into that, so now I'm back with my theologian's cap on. I was just in narrative mode. I'm in theolo theology mode now to help you. If you ever imagine God assuming that any of his creatures at any time can take him on, 
you got the wrong God. I just want you to know that, okay? Like he gives us the narrative so we can enjoy his journey. And it might look a little harrowing, but the battle's already won for those who know God. But he enters into time and space continuum in order to show how life really works on a practical level with you and me. Because when we get in trouble, we often have to wait for God to show up. Is that true, child of God? Well, then we are accommodating anthropomorphic experiences when in reality God is already present. And in what we would call teleologically, he's already fixed the matter. That's if you know the end from the beginning. And now I'm just waiting for the end to show up in the midst of my situation because God is actually using that event to teach me how to trust him. It's not that he's saying, I'm on my way, as if he way down the road, just hanging there, just hanging there, boy, I'm on my way, I'm coming, I'm coming. No, please understand, he's already here. I just have to wait on the Lord because he's building character and he's getting glory for himself in a multiplicity of ways. I got that? All things are working together for good to them that love God. I don't understand all the other stuff. And when I'm in the midst of the trial, the only thing I know is I've got to wait on the Lord because waiting on the Lord is my deliverance. All right. So in this situation, the Lord has come down. And he said these these cats will achieve human goals that will be of a phenomenal feat if there isn't divine intervention. Look at verse seven. So uh, now here God is going to move into another mode. And I want you to watch this narrative, learn something theologically because God will do this. He says in verse seven, go to let us go down. Do you guys see that? Yeah. So it's a recapitulation of the previous verse where it says, and the Lord came down, but he didn't come down by himself. He came down with his posse. And that's what he often does. This is another extrapolation upon beautiful gospel truth. And I'll just share it with you. Now, there is one true and living God. That's the Bible's clear on that, right? The Lord, our God, is one. But we know that the one true and living God is tri-personal, not unipersonal. He's not one person. He's three persons. But he is, by virtue of his Godhead, one God. Y'all got that? But also, as one God, he has under him an infinite number of angelic beings that serve in his posse. Y'all got that? And we could hire, we could give the hierarchy if we wanted to. We could talk about the cherubims. We could talk about the seraphim. We could talk about the warrior angels. We could talk about the worship angels, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're talking about his people being involved in that too. I'm on God's team. You, I'm part of his warrior tribe. You, I'm part of his worshiping tribe. I'm part of his PR club. I go around talking about God. Yeah, vote for God. Dude, get on God's team. Right, and that's the nature of what we're getting ready to talk about now in terms of Hashim, the fame, the fame, the fame. Because if you go back to verse uh, four, notice what they say, and this is where the offense is going to come in. And they say, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. That's a collaborative, right? Let us, let us, let us. And then they said, let us make us a what? A I said, see it? Yes. That's the Hashem. Let us make us a name. Let us make us a fame. Let's, let us make us a reputation. Let us be the word that's in people's mouths. Let people think about us all over the planet for who we are and for what we have done. That's what reputation is about. Y'all following what I'm saying? And is that not what goes on today? Yeah. The essence of what comes out of people's mouth today is all about the powers that presently be. Google, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. These are all big names that are coming out of people's mouths, not only rhetorically, but in terms of people's dependence, people's trust, people's hope, people's fear, people's dread. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? These are reputational characteristics, ladies and gentlemen, that have stolen God's glory. Am I making sense? 
Right, and that's why we laid out this argument this way under your fourth point. If you have your outline, the fourth point says the Hashim, the name, the usurpation of reputation. So I've told you the word to usurp means to unlawfully take the place of. So you only see that word usurp one time in your Bible, and that's in uh, 1 Timothy 2, where Paul says it is not lawful for a woman to usurp authority over a man, but to be in subjection. And that idea is she does not get to take a position that God has reserved for the man for in or in that she does that. She she is stealing authority. Y'all got that? Because God didn't give her that permission. She may be occupying it, but it's theft. So these people here are operating as an antichrist system, stealing God's glory getting fame all around the world because they want to make a what for themselves? A name. a name for themselves. That's the term Hashim. Y'all got it? Now I want to share two things with you on that one. We're going to move on to our, our next part, which is really good. Now you know God's not going to put up with that. How many of you guys know God is not going to put up with anybody trying to steal his glory? It just won't happen. I mean, so you might as well go get some popcorn and some something to drink because God getting ready to act. No flesh shall ever glory in God's sight. That's first Corinthians chapter one, verse 29. Just know that the arrogance of humanity is want, is wanting to be like God and God will give him five minutes to think about it. But the moment he sells out to the enemy and he becomes an antichrist. He's at war with God and he will lose. Y'all got it? That's why our fifth point was as it was. Now, the interesting thing about sub point B, corruption of the heart in pursuit of fame, is that there is, again, an endemic paradox in our text that underlies this behavior. Do you know what that is? It is the fact that once again, the sons of God are engaged in this apostasy. It is the fact that just like in Genesis 6, the sons of God married the daughters of men. Now the sons of God are engaged in a collaboration for a takeover of the world in the business sector. This is called apostasy as it is today. Let me see if I can help you. If you look back in chapter uh, 11, I'm going to start back at verse uh Verse, uh, how do I want to sneak and do it? Because I, I can do it at the latter part, but I think I will go back to chapter 10, verse 1. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Are you there? Now, these are the generations or the seed or the offspring of the sons of Noah. Now, what is the first name? What is the first name? Shem. The first son of Noah is what? That's our word, isn't it? Y'all with me? Notice what your outline says in point number four, the Hashem. Ha is a definite article in the Greek. It's like the, and the name is Shem. Y'all got that? Shem is the firstborn of Noah. Shem is the firstborn of Noah. Stay with me. I'm going to take you a little deeper, but I'm going to start here. Shem means name. Shem means the name, the Hashim, that's your fourth point. Shem means the name. So who's leading up this cabal of crooks wanting to build a tower to God, but the son of Noah, and his name is Shem. Well, you have to know that. Hold on, child of God. Ain't but six, ain't but eight people came out the ark. This is why the title of our study is the Nephilim versus the sons of God, the Adams family. The Adams family is Noah and his three sons, three daughter-in-laws and wife. They are the new Adams family. Y'all keeping up with me? So now I know you slow, but I, I, can't, I can't slow down too much. So I want you to stay with me. I'm going back to the first Adam family. I'm gonna see if y'all can catch up, okay? Because I'm trying to finish today. So the first Adam family was one man and one woman. 
That's Genesis chapter 2, 22 through 24. We're going to go back there in a moment. Adam, that's his name. And his wife was Miss Adam. He's Ish, she's Ishi. Just the two people. But everything came from those two, right? Of one man, God made all the nations of men upon the earth. So we get down to Noah's day. And what does God do to the whole human race in Noah's day? Wipe it out. But he leaves one family. This is Noah's family. And Noah is now the what? New what? Adam's family. I thought about that for several weeks once I laid that down and said, look at the way the world wants to mock God. Now, how many of you guys grew up with me watching TV? I watch way too much TV. But I used to love watching the Adams family. Da 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 da. And think about it. Think about the characters in the Adams family. You got monsters and warlocks and witches and vampires. Anybody keeping up with me? I know that the authors of that sitcom were making mockery of God. Y'all got that? Sure, it's going to come home now. And be, listen, okay, again, I'm not, going, I'm not going to continue extrapolating. I know you guys get revelations when I teach, as you should, because you should be able to see the world through biblical eyes. No human being can do anything with the material that's given to him, but that which is actually given to him. And humanity is always using God's material to pervert it. Especially Hollywood. Y'all got that? Hollywood knows how to mock God and make you laugh about it. It knows how to mock God and, and make you not even know you laughing right along with them mocking God. We did it all of our lives. Our kids are doing it right now in a horrible, horrible way. Is it coming home, child of God? And I just need you to know that. So when I say the Adam family is because God said I'm starting all over with Noah and his three sons and his three daughters and his wife. But many of us know chapter nine. We know that once Noah got out the ark, he started building vineyards. And we talked about that. I'm not going to stay there. But at a certain point, he just had a batch of those grapes and they just was too good. Anybody remember that? I just, it just had a, it just, it just went a little bit too far and it can happen. Not going to condemn it. He's saved by grace. Noah's one of the righteous men, most righteous men on the planet. Read Ezekiel 14 for yourself. Ezekiel 14 verse 14. Can you pull that up? I want you to get this. God said, although Noah, Daniel, and Job, if those three brothers was in the land, and I commend their righteousness, they won't be able to deliver the wickedness of the people around them, though they be righteous men. Y'all got that? I want you to, I want you to see this because I want you to, so please help me. We're at Ezekiel 14, 14, please. I want you to just make sure you capture this because it's important for you to know how God values his servants. So we're in Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men, who? That triad there are remarkable characters in the Bible, are they not? We learn so much from them, do we not? Like so much. And these, this text will show you how much God loves them because of how they bore record of him and how they suffered for his name. He lifts them up in the Old Testament as the pinnacle of righteous men. You got that? All right. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. <clears throat> In other words, what God was saying to Israel at that time was, you're not going to benefit just because Job, Noah, and Daniel are in the land. They get to go to glory on the grounds of them knowing God, and you still got to work out your own salvation. Y'all got that? One more verse, verse 20. I want you to see how this works. Do not miss this, child of God, because I, I labor really hard to teach within the confines of our time, but there's so much there. And to what extent you get it will be to the degree that you pay attention. Otherwise, you won't get it. Listen, he says it again in verse 20. So go back and read chapter 14. God was saying to Israel, look, y'all screwing up. 
I'm telling you, I'm going to get you. I mean, if you don't believe, go back to chapter 13, then go back to chapter 12. I know you went to government school, try to go back three or four chapters without losing your way and then make your way up to chapter 14. And you will discover that God had patiently warned them over and over. And what he was doing by using this remark about Noah, Job and Daniel was saying, hey, you're not going to get in on nobody else's righteousness. You understand that? Don't don't act like, you know, and this is a big problem with church folk too. Oh, my daddy's a pastor. You can still end up in hell. Do you understand that? In fact, this is what this verse explains. Notice how this verse says, though Nat, Noah, Daniel and Job were in it as I live. That's a that's a covenant swearing term that God uses. Saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their what? Did y'all just get that? This is telling us that when we go back to Noah's era, his three boys were still in danger on their own grounds for rebelling against God and ending up in hell, even though brother Noah killed it in terms of his mission. Am I making some sense? Because y'all know what happened. If you know, when he went to sleep being drunk, his grandson came in and saw him naked. And went out and told everybody, right? And that's when Noah was, uh, he was inclined to bring a curse on Canaan, the land of Canaan. Y'all remember that? The land of Canaan. Read it in your own time. And so here Noah has three boys who went through the judgment with him. We're going there tonight. They saw God's wrath come down on humanity. They lived for a whole year in the ark. It was a whole year, chapter 7, verse 11, chapter 8, verse 14, we'll touch it. Their whole year with the flood wiping out everything. They had a vivid revelation of God's justice, didn't they? Here we are two chapters later, and Shem, the firstborn, is leading a posse to build a tower to heaven to make a name for himself instead of a name for God. Y'all with me? That's what's going on here. Go back to our text, Genesis chapter 10, uh, 11, rather. I want you to look at uh, verse uh, 7, Genesis 10, uh, 11, 7. So start right here. Go to now, let us go down, and there do what? Confound. Confound, confuse, discombobulate their what? So now notice what God had to do in order to delay another execution of judgment upon a group of rebels. He had to scatter their capacity <clears throat> to actually agree by making sure he divided their tongues. He made sure that they woke up one day. This was an absolute miracle and they did not have the ability to communicate. No communion. That's what that means. <clears throat> so they were broken up. They were scattered. Listen to the language. And the Lord uh, and the Lord said, come, let us go down there and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Got it? All of a sudden now, this group who had almost developed a blockchain of singularity, because a blockchain of singularity for us at this present time in terms of artificial intelligence is computer language. You do have do understand that, right? It's computer language that creates the blockchain of our ability to communicate with all the other nations of the world. They don't care anything about your genetic variations in terms of being different ethnic groups. We all have to understand the same computer language. Got that? And so here God made sure that their computer completely disrupted. And then reversed the polarity so that rather than singularity occurring, total division set in. Now, all of a sudden, whereas they were compadres, they were unified in their thoughts and in their words. Now they're aliens to each other. Does that make some sense? He did that for their good. You got it? Because, see, they were set out to get glory for themselves. And God says that won't happen. And therefore, sometimes God has to scatter. I want you to get the lesson. <clears throat> this is Ecclesiastes chapter three and eight. 
In the book of Ecclesiastes, what does he say? There's a time for everything under the sun. There's a time to gather and there's a time to scatter. There's a time to come together and there's a time to disband. There's a time to love. There's a time to hate. There's a time of peace and a time for war. All these things go on in our world as God manages them because humanity is a group of rebels. Y'all got that? So when we look at the scattering principle here, we're seeing God in his mercy delaying their goal for tens of thousands of years to come. Why do I say that? Because they scattered and became nations all over the planet. And Abraham now is going to be lifted up in chapter 12 to become the conduit for God's purpose in Jesus Christ. And all we're going to have from chapter 12 all the way up to the end of Malachi, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And guess who Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are progenitor of? Shem. So Shem is the one acting the fool, and God's still going to use Shem to advance his purpose. Is God a God of mercy? Y'all got that? Right. So now, just in case you don't know, you bump right up on the Chaldaic, or what we would call Aramaic, or Hebraic expression for the Semite. Shem is your Semite. That's your Semitic language. Y'all got that? Shem. So when you hear people talking about anti-Semitism, they're talking about anti-Shemitism. So in the Hebrew, the H is silent. It's just Sim, Sim. Y'all got that? So Shem means name because God has chosen to make his name glorious through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and Jesus. Does that make sense? All right, good. That way I can kind of wrap this up and begin to move forward. So the way he does it is as we see it stated here in verse eight. So the Lord scattered them abroad from this upon the face of the earth, all the earth, and they left off to build the what? Right, because now the plans have changed abruptly. Every little balkanized group is a tribe now, and they got to figure out how to survive. So the first thing they had to do was separate and go find their own quarters so that they could actually manage enough people group to create a dialect in their own cultures. That's the history of mankind. Do you guys know that? That's the history of mankind. We all come from tr tribes. We all come from different tribes. And then in some larger tribes, there are even smaller tribes, S smaller different dialectos, smaller different genres of language. OK, and what God did with that was to slow us down so he could save us individually or selected through groups to preserve humanity until Jesus came. Y'all got that? That's exactly what that was about. Again, so I'm not going to go into the his history of that anymore fully, fully, uh, fully. But here's what I want you to see in verse uh, eight and nine again. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the face of the earth, all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called what? Babylon. Babylon. You got it? Babylon. And that's what the word Babylon means. Babel. City of confusion. Now, Babylon is the archetype, anti-archetype of the city that is constantly waging war against Jerusalem. Raise your hand if you guys know I've taught you that. So don't ever forget that. There's two cities in the Bible, the Babylonians and the Jerusalemites. OK, you all got that? The Babylonians and the Jerusalem. This is all metaphorical of the two major people groups of society. This is what you get in the book of the Revelation. So we discovered the Babylonian city in Revelation 17 and 18, harlot, mystery Babylon, mother of abominations, the city of Babylon. So remember, this is called a city whore, a city woman. That's how the church is. The church is a woman, but she's also a city, is she not? So Jerusalem is a woman city and Babylon is a woman city. These are two antithetical systems operating in this world. Y'all got that? And so these two systems in this world are drawing people from the masses of the populace into their citizenry. 
And sometimes the Babylonian system is able to swoop up whole swaths of people who pretend to be part of Jerusalem. And this is what is called the apostate church. When it gets swallowed up by the Babylonian system, you know it because it talks like them, it acts like them, it thinks like them, and it conforms to them. Did y'all get that part? How do we know we are an apostate church? When everything that the world tells us we believe and do. That's how you know you're an apostate church. That's why I asked you guys those questions I did earlier. Y'all got that? Because we're getting ready to go there. So I'm getting ready to lead you now to a brother whom God has shown grace in his life to keep him from going apostate. His name is Noah. His name is Noah. So everybody else had experienced something quite interesting. This fame or this name was actually their fall. Wanting fame for themselves, wanting a name for themselves, a reputation for themselves was their what? Now, remember what we learned the fall was? That's what the fall is, right? Y'all remember the Nafal? I want you to keep that in mind because I'm going to show you something about the Nafal. And it's really interesting that phonetically fall allows us to remember the Nafal, right? That's the verbal expression of the Nephilim, the fallen ones, to lose your dignity, to lose your status. And that's what it means to go apostate as well. When God honors you by bringing you into his family and then you in hypocrisy and in rebellion decide to dishonor God and walk away from God, then you are fallen. That's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve, did they not? I'm getting ready to show you that in the grammar so I can lead you to Brother Noah for a minute so we can have this Q&A. Because everything that I'm talking about, everything that I'm talking about, has everything to do with what's going on right now. Everything that I'm talking about has everything to do with what's going on right now. So, the Nephal, the fallen ones, the Nephilims, the giants that in their own pride and arrogance think that they're okay with God. We saw in Genesis chapter 11 just now, from 4 through 9, God shut them down, didn't he? Shut it down, shut it down. They fail because they thought that they could get to heaven on their own strength. Isn't that what it just stated? He, he, he knocked them down. So we would call that a fall. He scattered their upward mobility. They have fallen. But there was a fall earlier that I want you to see briefly where the term the fall is using. I'm going to preach on this one on Sunday. And I want you to see it in Genesis chapter 4. And I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 4 at verse 4, and I'm going to show you this fall again. I'm going to preach it more fully on Sunday. Let me show you the tie. So let's start at verse 1. i got enough time to unpack this and us have a good Q&A. And Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son, and his name is what? Cain is the firstborn, just like Shem was the firstborn. All right, remember I taught you the rule of recapitulation? Cain is the firstborn, just like Shem is the firstborn. And so firstborns often are assumed to have the privileges, but they end up acting a fool. Well, we know that because Adam is the first Adam and then Jesus is the last Adam, right? So you have this first and this last. So that's why Jesus meant when he says the first shall be last and the last shall be what? So that even though in a fleshly sense or in a physical sense or in an earthly sense, you might be first, you might be last in the spiritual sense. It all depends on how you behave. OK, so it's important. To, it's important to know that. So Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. That was a big deal, wasn't it? That's her first boy. Now, you can hold all Sunday school questions to our, to our time of Q&A, which will be coming up shortly, and I'll try to help you with whatever conundrums you have there. And it's important to know that it's, it's all right to have questions, all right? So this is the first one they have. And notice what the text says. And she again bare his what? So we know that because there was no tricky business going on, there was no milkman that slipped in. Right. What, 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 there was no Amazon guy that just decided to hang out a long time. No, 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 none of that, right? No, no Xfinity guy working too long on the TV while Adam is going off. It's just Adam and Eve. Cain comes from those two. So does his brother who? 
That's what we're going to be preaching on Sunday. So you guys getting a bit of a precursor. All right. So this is this is called the continuity of theology. This is why you want to know the narratives. Because when your New Testament prophets and teachers are speaking, they're speaking from this kind of context that I'm sharing with you. So when you know the narrative richly, you can understand why Jesus says, love your enemies. Y'all got what I just stated? Because we're dealing with two boys. And they're going to end up in what I shared with you on Sunday, cross purposes. Is that true? Is that true? And the commandment from Jesus to solve that cross purposes problem is what? Love your enemies. Y'all got that? Because if you love your enemies, already presupposing to love your neighbor, ain't nobody dying by you. Y'all got that? Now, this is important to get here, children of God, because the goal of the gospel is reconciliation. It's not just killing people and dividing people and destroying people, but we got a situation about to come up here, don't we? Don't we have a situation coming up? And God wants this knucklehead boy who is the firstborn to act like Jesus. But he won't. Will he? And I want you to see the inherent terminology that underscores this. And I'll unpack it on Sunday. Here it is. And she began, she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Again, I love those two distinctions because that was fundamentally what it was with Jacob and Esau. Jacob was a keeper of sheep, stayed home with mama, and Esau was a man of the field. So there you go, your recapitulation principle again. See, and God does that in order for us to get that kind of paradoxical tension. Now look at verse three. And in process of time, if I was teaching theology, if I was teaching uh, 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 bibli, uh, 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 biblical theology, that text would require us to now work through the genealogical tables. And I would have to call your attention to the fact that process of time for you and me might be five or ten years in the New Testament context of events occurring, of which if you're not sensitive to the chapters, and what goes on in between chapters could be years. From one chapter to the next could be 10 years. You understand that? Here, before the flood and the destruction of humanity, one chapter to the next or one verse to the next could be hundreds of years. Raise your hand if you're already with me. Why? Because the average time span for human beings was 800, 900 years. I just want you to get that. So, because you're going to be, where did Cain get his wife from? All right. Once you spread the timeline out, once you spread the timeline out, we're pretty good, right? Now, I know it's a struggle for us because we don't get but 80, 90 years, and, and, you know, we going downhill after 40. But, no, you just have to know in process of time, a lot of stuff is going on in that little space. Y'all with me? A lot, of, a lot of stuff going on in there. So in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. The inference here is that Cain and Abel knew that God was to be worshipped. I'm not going to say any more until Sunday. So Cain brought what he brought. Verse 4. And Abel, his little brother, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof. So two different offerings are brought to the same God, and this is going to be the premise of the problem. These are called worship wars, okay? These are church folk about to fight. I'll leave that with you. We'll, we'll see it clearly and vividly on Sunday, okay? These are Christians, Christians about to fight over worship issues. Here we go. And he also brought the first sling of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his sacrifice. You can dig how deep you want to. Just make sure that you know what Abel knows and then you're all right. Because if you don't, you might not be all right. Because the narrative is letting us know that God approved of Abel's sacrifice. And that's huge. Now look at the next one. 
Verse five. But unto Cain and to his offering, God had no respect. All right. You really want to know what that was about, too, because it's very possible that you and me commit the same crime. If you don't think you do, you probably do. You got that? If you don't think you do, you probably do. If you think that you're always able and not sometimes Cain, you're deceiving yourself. Y'all got that? So we'll, we'll talk that through. So like, if you don't think you're a sinner, then you got the same problem Cain does. If you don't think from time to time, you just bring to God the opinion of your own mind and want God to sign off on it, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Am I telling the truth? You're lying. Uh, yeah. So Cain and Abel is both my problem and yours too. But whatever went down, God didn't look twice on what Cain did. He looked twice on what Abel did. Remember, I taught you the word respect literally means to see it twice. That's what re is. Again, specter to see. When you don't respect someone, you don't look at them twice. Did that, did that come home? I'm trying to teach y'all how the word of God works. When you despise somebody, you don't regard them. When you honor somebody, you look on them substantially. You look at them again and again and again. Y'all got that? You look at them until you reach that level of reciprocity of respect for them that an impression is made on your mind of them. That's called honoring. That's why we would respect God, wouldn't we? Right. So, but Cain and to his offering, God did not have respect. And here's where I'm going to stop. And Cain was very, what's the word? Angry. So pick it up. Have you ever got angry at something that didn't go your way? Of course you have. Because Cain is your uncle. That's why Cain is Uncle Cain. Have you ever heard the term raising Cain? There we go, right there. That's it. Were you a Cain raiser? Okay, then. So you got more Cain blood in you than you thought. Some of us do. All right, so. Just true. So, you know, when the house all tore up, you're raising Cain. All right. Notice that Cain responded to God's disrespect of his offering with anger. You guys notice that? And something happened. Do you know what happened? He fell. The word is right there. And his countenance nafal. Y'all learning? Y'all learning? This is why the word of God is so beautiful. Because when you slowly read it and let it teach you, you learn the mysteries of the kingdom. So this is not the first fall, but this is a significant fall. So Cain fell. And then we have the fall again in Genesis 6. Then we have the fall again in Genesis 11. Seems like we've fallen all over the place, right? It's just, just the way it is. Now, having said that, I'm not going to mess with that now. I touched on that on Sunday. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6, because now I want to talk about this strange but wonderful thing that God does <clears throat> with us fallen people. Because if you look at verse 8, of Genesis 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You will have to be careful in approaching that proposition to make sure that your conclusions correspond with everything that you have learned about how God views humanity and, and acts one way or another towards them. Because in the larger text of chapter six, he's angry. Now we got Cain angry over in chapter four. We got the Nephilim, the giants, the renowned people 
angry in chapter six because the whole earth is full of violence. So anger is all up in there. Would it not be? Anger is everywhere because they're violent people. The earth is filled with violence. So everybody want to be angry. Cain want to be angry. The folks in Genesis 6 want to be angry. The only real person that has a right to be angry is God. Right? The wages of sin is what? Right. So, but God puts up with angry people. That's why you saved. That's just why you say, because God puts up with angry people. I can talk this through, but I want you to just catch it because I want to lead us to know it. I want to ask you a question as we look at this proposition and then begin to deal with the three points that I think are just um, adumbrations. They're just uh, overarching principles that lay out the character of the Adams family. This is the biblical Adams family. It's not Hollywood version. It's the biblical Adams family. So let me ask you the question. Do you think... By nature, that Noah was any different than those giants and renowned men and those marauders and those crooks and those thugs in the generation in which he lived. I'm going to say it again. I want you to think about this because you need to understand how grace works. Do you think that by nature, somehow Noah escaped? the endemic qualities of barbarism and hostility and, and, and range and domination and, 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 and terrorism and, and inclination to, to be a marauder and to take things. Do you think that God looked on Noah and said, because Noah is better than the rest, I'm going to show him grace? No. Right. So if you all have affirmed that this cannot possibly be the case, then you understand a little something about grace. The moment you pour into grace, the notion that God picks you over somebody else as a consequence of something he sees in you that he doesn't see in somebody else, it is no longer grace, it's works. It's works. God is choosing you because of something in you. Did y'all hear what I just stated? Right, so it's important to know. It's important to know that when God smiles on you with favor, it's not because you didn't been a goody two shoe. That's Santa Claus. That's called works religion. He's coming to see if you're naughty or nice. And if you're nice, then you get a gift. If you're not nice, you won't get a gift. That's Catholicism. That's works religion. Y'all know I talk that every year at Christmas time. That's an abomination to the gospel. Would it be? Don't ever tell your kids now if you don't get if you're not nice. Santa Claus ain't going to bring you no gifts. Stop lying to them kids. You're teaching them salvation by works. Did anybody get that? Because then they're going to pretend to be good. And they're on their way to hell. Because they're lying to themselves. They're lying for you. And they're lying to God. And you taught them a lie about God. Didn't you? Now, you know, God gives you gifts just because he wants to. Is that true? Right. Now, think about this. Now, you know, you're in the stead of God. Do you know that? Can I talk to you for a few more minutes? You in the stead of God. Them, your children. They're no one else's children. They're yours. You know, they bad. <laughs> Nobody had to come knock on the door and say, sis, you know you got some bad kids. You, you, you. <laughs> now, you stupid. If you think that your kids are bad all by themselves, like the, the fruit didn't fall far from the tree, right? So grace demands that you know how to exercise love, agape, in spite of what they do, but because of who they are. You give it to them because they're your children. And God gives us his graces because we're his. That's all that is. Did y'all get that? His goodness to us is because we're his children, Brother Matt. Right. 
Because if he looked at us on the grounds of what we're done, David said it. If the Lord should mark iniquities, nobody's standing. Ain't no gifts coming this year. And Santa's mad at us because we behaved in a way that didn't merit the gifts. That is not the gospel of the grace of God. Y'all got that? So I'm just simply saying that because Brother Noah is special to God because God wanted to be special to Noah. He chooses us because he wants to. He loves us because he wants to. Did y'all get that? And it's not because he had to. Because if he had to, it would still be merit. He loves you because he wants to. He chose you because he wanted to. He's calling you to himself and giving you what he gives you because he wants to. You didn't choose to be in the family of God. He chose you to put you in his family. He adopted you. Am I making some sense? And the next thing, you looked up and God's blessing you. That's what Noah would tell you. Now we know that because the moment that boy got out that boat after a year of being tossed to and fro, first thing he did was build him a wine vineyard. Raise your hand if I'm making sense. Raise your hand if I'm making sense. See? And I've, I've justified him. Don't nobody need to be getting drunk, but I'm going to tell you, if you went through what Noah went through for a whole year, my goodness, you're going to find something to ease the pain. Plus, God wants you to be happy. And the fruit of the vine is a symbol of the atoning work of Christ. And because it is a symbol of the atoning work of Christ, the fruit of the vine makes the heart glad. And the Holy Ghost causes the face to shine. That's Psalm 104. If you need a text to understand the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. One of the things God don't ever really want his people to do is going around acting like God don't make us happy. That's false religion. Y'all hear what I'm saying? That is false religion. All right. We got some things to do because here in our text, in our outline, we come down to the cane. The cane this time is Shane in the Hebrew. That uh, that word Shane is what I'm going to use here. And that simply means grace. It means favor. It means God's mercy or what we would call his has said. This is when God becomes covenantally bound to you to make sure that you are in a course where his love can become the parameters by which you get down the road of his plan in your life. OK, you understand that we can adumbrate it by the word love, because biblically love is making sure that the object of that love has everything that it needs to be able to do what God has called it to do and to get where it needs to get without any harm. That's what love is about. We learned that last week. Love seeks the highest good for its object. And so what God decided to do with all of these tow up people was to simply use Noah. To start all over again. Because God is a God of second chances. I just want you to know that. OK, so now I want to just share with you three things that Noah did being an object of God's grace. By grace, Noah believed. Y'all got that? By grace, Noah believed. I need you to get that. Grace is required for you to believe God. You will not believe God apart from his grace. Did that come home? Right. There is no intrinsic faith on your part. You and I, by nature, are unbelievers. If we ever come to believe God, it was because he graced us to believe. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Don't ever steal God's glory from him by saying by nature you are a believer. You are not a believer by nature. By nature you're a rebel sinner and you won't believe God. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Y'all got that? Yeah. So if you discover that you trust God, that you believe God, that you're leaning into God, that you're depending upon God, he gave you the grace to do it. That your neighbor next to you don't have any time for God is because he hasn't found the grace to believe God. You did. And that's all there is to it. 
And don't waste a whole lot of time trying to figure out why your neighbor doesn't have the grace you do. Look, everybody is not in everybody's family. I was like saying, Daddy, how come you're not the daddy of all of the rest of the kids on the block? Is this good teaching or what? Is this good teaching? Right. So, so you need to get this now because, you know, see, after a certain point, the questions get stupider. Right. They do. Right. And, and, and what God will tell you is, look, don't worry about all those other kids. Just act like you got my name. Because that's what the name is all about. See, we have his name. We're children of the living God. We are sons of God. That's his name. This is the Ben Elohim. This is the Jesus Christos. This is what we are. We are children of God through Christ. Christ is the ontological son. We are the adopted sons of God. He is our father. We cry, Abba, Father. That came from somewhere. Didn't come from me. The Holy Ghost gave me that spirit of adoption by which I know he is my God, my father. So I call on him because Jesus is my big brother. Now, I wish everybody else was, but that's daddy's business. Y'all understand that? That's daddy's business. What I'm going to do is learn how to operate in the parameters of being a son of God. All right, so this is important now. This is going to get to our conversation. I'm going to need two runners on the mic here in a second. I need two guys to come down and just do some Q&A because I'm going to revisit the question now that we're here. And I want to I want to see if we can work through this, okay? Three things that you have to know about Noah and his family. The first is God gave them grace to do what? Believe. They were believers. Yeah, you can give him two, you can take two. And y'all can do either side. The second thing you need to know is that God gave them grace to be witnesses. Yeah. To bear witness. Y'all got that? So when he gives you the gift to believe, that's a seed of certification on the inside that you have a relationship with God. Nobody really can see the root of that. That's what the Holy Spirit gives you. So you got a relationship with God. But that believing must manifest itself in a missional conduct on your part because God has given you and me to be his sons and daughters so that the world can know who God is through us. Got that? So while faith is personal, it's not private and it's not hidden. Now, it may take some while to come up because it's sown deep. But eventually it's going to have a stock. It's going to have a trunk. It's going to grow up and create some branches. It's going to have some leaves. It's going to bear some fruit because that's called bearing witness to the God of glory who saves you by his grace. So Noah was given the grace to believe and Noah and his family were given the grace to bear witness. How long? A hundred years. Y'all got that? A hundred years. Go back to Genesis chapter uh, Genesis chapter 7, and I want to see how I'm going to do this. Gen okay, let me see here. Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. Genesis 7, 11. Now notice what it says in Genesis 7, 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life. Y'all got that? How old is Noah when God called him? He was a young teenager of 600 years. Isn't that what the text just said? Well, y'all look at that. Quit talking and listen now. What did it say right there? In the 600th year of Noah's life. Remember I told you they lived 900 and he's 600 years old. Now he's a young strapling. Just view him as about 22, 23 years old. Okay? That's young strapling. In the second month, in the 17th day of the month, Moses under inspiration of the Holy Spirit is giving you right down to the detail. When God called him to his mission. Y'all got that? 600 years. Noah's life in the second month. 17th day of the month. The same day where all the fountains of the great earth broken up. Do you guys see that? So then go back to Genesis chapter. Um, 
Job chapter six, and we will discover that Moses was 500 years old when God called him. Let me see here. Where are we at in that in chapter what? Verse 32. A 532. There it is. That's exactly what we wanted. Go back to verse 31. And all the days of Lamech were 770 years, 77 years. And he died. That's his daddy. 777 years. And Noah was how old? 500 years old when Noah begot Shem, Ham and Japheth. So the three boys were born when he's 500. God now is calling them at 600 years old to go into the ark. Y'all got that? So how how old are those boys? That's somewhere between very toddlers, toddlers, 75, 80, right? Young, barely walking. And at 600 years old, they're all going into the ark. That's Abraham over in chapter 7, verse 11. Y'all got that? Now look over in chapter 8, verse 14. I'm going to start back at verse 13. Are you there? And it came to pass in the 600th year, in the first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry, and in the second month of the seventh and twentieth day of the month was the earth what? And notice what it says in verse 13. And it came to pass in the 600 and what year? First year. Now, when did the water come down? In the 600 year. Right. Did y'all remember that? All right. Cause I want you to go back there because I, I just want to make sure you get that. Go back to chapter seven, verse 11. I know we're doing math. Y'all, We're going to get through this. OK, we're going to get through this. Verse 11, 600 years. Y'all see that? 600 years. What is the month? Second. What is the day of the month? Go over to chapter 8 and start again at verse 13. And it came to pass in the 600 and what? First year. So we got just about a year done, don't we? Yeah. We got 600 when they went in, 601 when they came out. And notice what it says because it gets detailed. It says 600 years of the first year in the first month. In the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the earth and ground of the ground was dry. But notice what it says in verse 14. And in the second month of the seventh and the 20, 20th day, 27th day of the month was the earth. What? Dry. It was a year long period of the rain pouring down, them being in the ark, them going through the flood and then the waters receding. Now, the water came down 40 days. Because the heavens broke up and the earth yielded up water that was in it. So the heavens came down profusely and the whole earth was flooded. Y'all got that? 40 days. But that water stayed on the land the rest of that year. So Noah couldn't come out of the ark until all the ground was what? Dry. So he was in this ark for over a year with his family, wasn't he? All right. So we're almost there. We're almost there. I said that he had to bear witness. So if he bore witness in the 500th year to the 600th year, that was how many years he had to do it? 100. That was 100 years of preaching, 100 years of building that ark. Now we're coming to the questions that I want us to work through. I want you to get this now. And then in that 100th year, He's now in the boat for one year. So for 100 years, he's building this ark. For a year, him and his family are in the boat. Y'all got that? So I just repeated it because I want you to get it because I'm going back to the questions now that I raised before. And I'm going to answer this last one here in a second. The last one is going to give us the gospel. Grace to believe. Grace to bear witness. To bear witness for how long? 100 years. Now, I've been a Christian 40 years. I feel like that's a long time. It's nothing compared to 100 years. You got that? And I've been, in, I've been a Christian in a culture and a time where I can say there has been ups and downs and good and bad in our era. And a lot of you guys can bear record with that, us coming through the same era. Things have increasingly gotten worse since I was saved. 
Can you can you bear record to that? Just culturally, circumstantially, morally. I mean, it's getting bad. I can actually bear record of the era in which Noah lived. Where the imagination of the heart of man is only continually evil and the policies coming out of the thugs and crooks produces violence in the earth. And all flesh is corrupting its way upon the earth. Can y'all bear record with that? That's where it's coming. Now, as it was in Noah's day, so it is in our day. We can't put definitive detail on the proportions of the evil because we're limited as human beings in that regard. Like you and I don't live everywhere present in the world to have a, a kind of generalized understanding of the oppression and the evils that's going on in the world. Other parts of the world, they're going through way worse evils than we are. And so for them, in the context of their trouble, they would say to you and me, you got to suck it up because y'all got a lot of grace. But we still got battles to fight, don't we? Because hell's trying to swallow us up, too. But we got brothers and sisters that are really going through it. They know more about the intensity of the paradoxical tension that Noah is going through, wouldn't they? All right. So I'm getting ready to ask the question. I just need I just want those who are under my teaching to learn how to benefit from the Bible for all it's worth. Otherwise, you miss the glory. Noah and his family are to be highly commended. Highly commended because they weren't weak, wimpy Christians. They were not. The evil that was going on in Noah's day could have easily distracted him at any time over those hundred years that he was doing what he was doing. How many of us as Christians find ourselves frequently distracted from God, wrapped up in all kind of carnal stuff that has nothing to do with glorifying God or bringing men and women to a saving knowledge of Christ? Y'all got that? Stay with me. Almost there. But Noah had a mission for which him and his family, three sons, three daughters and a wife, were called. And I want you to get this now to actually bring about what is called the Ark of Revelation. The Ark of Revelation. Now, he built a literal Ark, did he not? That ark was a visible manifestation of his faith in God. Stay with me. Because I want you to get this. This is why God loved him. Because every day that Noah and his wife and his three sons and his daughters live, the world had to see a testimony of faith growing. Board by board, plank by plank, week in and week out. And it started with just a few feet. And the next thing you know, over a hundred year period, it is a two football field long arc of relentless, unavoidable testimony of the revelation of God's will to that world. Are y'all hearing me? This is why I said earlier, can you imagine what it's like to be confronted with truth that you can't get away from and every day the revelation of that truth is increasing? Its testimony is abounding. Every time you look up, more and more evidence is mounting for the testimony of that ark and its revelatory impact. Now, you are part of that group who don't believe. But every day you're being confronted with the evidence. Why do I call it evidence? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen 
the ark becomes an evidence of what God had told Noah was true about what God was going to do. Y'all with me? This is so important to get. So every day, Noah and his wife and his sons and, and his daughter-in-laws are engaging in bearing record to the truth of God amongst a culture who are constantly trying to deny the reality. We know this because no one was saved. No one was saved. See, this is a family affair, the Adams family. It's a type of God's elect. Y'all got that bigger picture? But God's elect is just a small group of people telling the truth as it is in Christ. Plank by plank, board by board, nail by nail, pitch by pitch. To a world that does not want to believe, even though the evidence is mounting against them. Is it, is it mounting? And this is why I ask you the question, and I'm ready to go into it shortly. What must it feel like to be living in an open hostility against a truth claim that's unavoidable for which you neither want to affirm or sufficiently refute existing? What must be going on in the mind of all of those people on the planet who can't get away from the evidence because the evidence is there. Are y'all hearing me? That's what I want us to talk about. So the question is going to be, do you know what it's like? Have you been in a situation where somebody told you the truth and you didn't want to believe it? Although the evidence is showing up every day. And you can neither affirm it because you just are stuck in your position. Y'all understand where I'm going? You're stuck in your position. You, this, is, this is what you believe. Planks coming up every day. By just a, a family who's committed to the truth. So I ask the question, what must it feel like for all those people to have heard the preaching and saw the visible manifestation of a family of faith telling them what really was going on while they were believing a lie. Y'all understand where I'm going? Because for them, as long as they didn't see it, it wasn't true. But really, they saw the evidence because the evidence was the plank and the nails, and the boards. And it wasn't diminishing evidence. It was growing evidence, emerging every day for a 100 years. And it was actually forming and shaping into the very thing that the witness had said that it would form and shape into. And I can, I can surmise, and we get to talk about this now, and y'all can up there if you want to uh, insert, because I'd love to know, because I haven't been here. I don't know what it's like to have been told the truth and relentlessly reject it. While that truth is abounding in his testimony. See, because the Noah event is describing what Jesus said in Matthew 24, what it would be like in the days in which in which men and women don't believe God. Y'all got that? And so you might have been through it. You might have been in a situation where something did not allow you to affirm the evidence. And, and I'm, I want to kind of just talk that through and, and, and know what that feels like. If, if you do, if you don't, don't try to imagine because you're going to waste our time. Some of us are worse sinners than others in here, okay? So some of us are just not that bad where we, you know, can just resist the truth even though the evidence is mounted. Y'all got that? Right? Because here is what the Bible said 
in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 first. I'm going to give you three verses. We're going to do some microphone talking. Because I just want to, I want us to share. I want us to put our feet in the shoes of the whole society of rebels against the witness. Then I want us to put our feet in the shoes of the family that's under assignment to tell the truth even if nobody wants to believe it. Because that's what this account is about. Look at verse 11. By what? By what? Does that mean that Noah was pleasing to God? Yeah. Because what we learn in verse 6 is that without faith, you can't please God. Does this also mean that Noah was operating out of a pattern of obedience that had no empirical foundation upon it? Absolutely. He's doing something on the grounds of a promise before the evidence shows up. That's what pleases God. Because what it indicates is, is that Noah did what? He believed God. This is crazy, right? Noah steps out on faith to engage in a visible witness for God's glory. When nothing in creation could affirm what Noah was doing as being logical and right. Never rained before. Y'all got that? Never rained before. The only integrity that Noah had was the authority that God had told him to do it. All right, here we go. So by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not yet, what? Isn't that faith? What did it do? It moved him with fear. In other words, he believed God. And now godly fear is operating. This is so important. This is called godly fear to move him up out of the lackadaisical state of the rest of society that already had chosen to block God out. Is that true? So like like Noah is not wrestling with in his mind at this moment what everybody else going to think. What everybody No, Noah has his mind fixed on God and what God had just said to him. And this now moves Noah into witness protection mode. It's really true. It's really true because he's now got to testify for God in the courtroom of the conscious of millions of people on the planet. Is that right? And he's got to fear God more than he fears man. All right. Moved with fear, prepared an ark. I call this the ark of revelation because it was the ark of revelation to the saving of his house. What he did saved his house. Y'all got that? What he did saved his house. He labored to the end that his house would be saved. He didn't waste his time. He didn't dilly dally. He had a hundred years. God had told him when it was going to be done. And remember, if you know the text, on the very day that God said, all right, time is up, Noah, you and the family come on in. Do you guys remember that? And when they came in, God shut the door. And that was the end of the testimony. And this is a great example of what will happen before Christ comes. We will be done with the witness. And God will draw his people in and he will put a total covering over us and deliver us from a wrath that will come upon humanity. Now, the world doesn't believe what I just stated. The world doesn't believe this, Matt. And so it don't live like this. And most church folk don't believe this either. And so they don't live like it. Now watch this. By which he did what? Bless the world? Condemn the world. You guys got that? So now watch this. Um, he walking by faith, building a revelation in the ark, condemned the world. So daily, they're under conviction by that man's faithfulness to God. Y'all got that? By that woman's faithfulness to God. By their simply committing to what God told them to do. Condemnation is said, isn't that the way it works? I'm, I'm asking you the question by which he condemned the world and became heir of everything. Isn't that true? 
By the time the rain was over with, he comes out the boat. Him and his family are running the world. Isn't that a type of the promises of God to us? The meek shall inherit the earth. But you know what? You and I, we got to go through some trouble. Y'all understand that? Because in him bearing witness, God had to give him grace and his family grace to suffer. Didn't he? But the suffering that they went through was a suffering of baptism. Y'all got that? It was a suffering of baptism. I want you to get the gospel now. Because we are told in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, these words. I want you to hear this now. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, this is what Peter says about Noah and his family. And I want to show you the gospel here. And then we're going to talk. At what time, uh, which sometimes were disobedient, talking about the people in Noah's day, when once the long suffering of God, what was that? The hundred year period that God was patient with the world of God waited in the days of who? So God was waiting for Noah to finish his witness. While the ark was in preparing, wherein a whole lot of people, is that what it says? No. No. So Noah lived in what we call the narrow road gospel. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Is that Noah's account? Yeah. Now watch this. That is eight souls were saved by what? Water. By the Nephal. Now let me help you. I want you to get this. The fall that happened with Cain, his continence, the fall that happened with the Nephilim and God's wrath coming upon them because God's wrath came upon them. Do you know what that wrath was? Rain falling down on them. Right. Isn't that the way the wrath works? So the Nephal came upon the fallen ones because they rejected the only way of escape. Anybody with me? Anybody with me? So see. If you're going to be a fallen one, you got to know that God can fall better than you can fall. In other words, if you're going to be a big dog, you're going to be renowned, you're going to be the thug, you're going to trample people down. Understand there's a fall coming down from heaven. And that fall is going to wipe out all fallen ones. And Noah did not escape the fall, nor his family. But according to the doctrine of baptism, they went through the fall. How many of y'all know what I'm saying? They entered into the ark and that ark is a picture of who? Christ. Christ, who bore the wrath of God. The fall came on the ark. They were on the inside. They went through too. Now, everybody in the world could have entered into that ark, but they rejected the gospel. They rejected the truth claims. But Noah was saved by what? Grace. And grace is the doctrine of substitution where Jesus dies in our place. The ark is a type of Christ bearing the same wrath that came upon all those people on the earth. And Noah went through that because our sins have to be paid for too. Didn't I tell you Noah was no different than anybody else but the grace of God. Now y'all understand the doctrine of baptism, do you not? So this is what he says in verse 21. This is what he meant in verse 21. First Peter 3, 21. Here it is. The light figure where unto even what? Baptism. Where unto what? Baptism. Baptism is when you go on the inside, joining Jesus in his death and therefore coming up out of that death with Jesus in newness of life. That's what Peter understood. He understood that those eight, eight souls, they went through the water. They felt the wrath, only they were covered by the grace of God. And they were covered by the grace of God, having testified to that grace for a hundred years. Y'all get that? For a hundred years. For a hundred years, they're walking by faith. For a hundred years, they're telling the truth. For a hundred years, they're condemning the world. Peter said Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I bet he was. I bet you all the newspapers for a while was talking about him. 
running clips, ridiculing him, scorning him. At a certain point, because they have tour buses coming to look at that boat. And they was laughing and mocking him. And then they also had to censor him. That's my opinion. Because, see, the goal is to make sure that you minimize the impact of the witness by ridiculing it. Does that make some sense? But now I want to go into the question with you guys, because this is clear to me. Is it clear to you? That when we are called by God to be his Adam family, we're called to believe, we're called to bear witness, and we're called to bear the sufferings of Christ for Christ's glory to a world that hates us and hates God too. So I want to ask, and, and you'll get to answer maybe two questions each, uh, uh, two questions. One of each question, the first question is, what could you surmise that Noah and his family went through by way of provocation or suffering during that hundred year period? Secondly, what must it have been like in the conscience of people who had to bear record to the truth with its witness increasing for a hundred years? of which they didn't want to affirm, but they had no ability to deny. So as the mics go around, I want you to share if you got some thought and don't preach for an hour because I'm going to stop you. Because <laughs> I gave you all this time to think it through. These are some great questions because Noah's day is going on right now. So who's ready to share? We got a good house today. Who's ready to share your sense of what was going on with the Adams family? Or what was going on with the people that didn't want to believe the Adams family? All right, come on. Come, what, what, what my brother over here? Cause we'll start, we'll start with, uh, both of y'all can talk. Uh, Terry and then, and then uh, Brother Mark. Anybody on this side? Anybody over here? Don't be afraid. We've got one with, with uh, Nairobi. Anybody on this side? Don't be afraid. This is supposed to be a thinking class. All right, Terry. Pastor, um, I can't truly understand what it must have been like for those people to continually reject what Noah was preaching, teaching, and showing them. But I can look back on my life and see myself similar in those same circumstances before God reached down and got a hold of me. Is that it? Okay, so you, you can't surmise anything on the part of Noah in terms of him and his family. What might they have gone through? Well, I can see the evil that I have experienced just in my lifetime and what's going on in this world and having... Uh, been able to be in a position to see more than what normal people do see uh, based upon my career in the military. Um, and matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why I departed the military. Got it. So. Got it. Mark. Anybody on? Okay, you got not regard on Mark. Um, could it be that. The you got to put the mic closer because we oh, can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, what these other people that weren't that were surrounding Noah were they all the descendants of Cain? Because I always, because I, I was. It couldn't possibly be. Because he was the wanderer and he was never judged, right? He just, he just. Right. So I want you to think this through because you're going to end up destroying. It had to be both lines. It had to be the line of Cain and the line of Seth. Chapter four and five is the line of Cain and the line of Seth. The line of Seth didn't disappear. But what about if they married into him? The, daughter, the sons of God married the daughters of Cain. That was the line of Seth. But did that, did that make them? The daughters of Cain and the line of Seth actually become the marauders. Right, but it's, it, what, it's, what does it mean by it? It's just Noah's perfect in his generations then. 
That means that Noah trusted God. That's all that meant. He trusted okay. to, to every believer is perfect in Christ. Are we not? Okay. And we're perfect by faith. So it's the word that means to have the level of maturity that you didn't go around committing spiritual idolatry. So, so David was perfect in his generation. David never, never traded his God. He just was human, wasn't he? So the Bible calls you and I perfect in Christ. Mature in Christ, meaning that we don't love Jesus one day and then love the world the next day and then go and bow down and worship other idols hither and yon. Ain't but one God for me, one Savior for me, one Lord, right? And, and my life will, over the tenor of that testimony, show itself to be that. That's what's going to distinguish me from an apostate Christian. That's what's going to distinguish me from a wicked world that has no desire to actually be on this side of the testimony. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yes, the children of Cain, the daughters of Cain, ended up merging with the sons of Seth, and they created the false religion of that time that became prominent and powerful. I talk about this all the time, right? Mixing politics and religion gives you a group of powerful people who are hypocrites. All right. So, anybody else want to take a shot at it? Uh, Nairobi. And then bring it up here. Bring it up here. Bring it up here. That, that John can bring it up to Brother Matt. Nairobi, go ahead on. Uh, okay, I, um, for Noah and his family, I'm, I'm trying to imagine. John, I mean, Matt, go ahead on, go ahead on, Noah. How, how they would feel is, I can imagine they would, they would be like, they would be social like pariahs, uh, outcasts. And then they'd be famous ones at that. Because they were the, everybody knew about them. Pointing the finger to them. They were, you know, just like today, you know, um, uh, the doctors who want to talk about uh, the truth about COVID, you lose everything, right? It, it costs you everything. And you're a laughing stock. So it had to be, I can only imagine, it had to be extremely hard. It's, it's hard if, you, if you're just in your little circle and you become the ridicule of whatever, let alone on a, on a global or a world level. Keep that mic up. On a, you know, with everyone looking at you. Under, so I can... It, it, it had to be extremely hard, and only the grace of God can get a, a person through something like that. Right. And far as the the people, what they were thinking, I can only like we say, there's there's, there's nothing new under the sun. So so when I think about, it, I think about like 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 now you have great theologians and uh, uh, apologists who can who can go through the Bible and and and, and, and um, break things down and show you what this and that means, but. Like the Bible says to a carnal man, these things are foolishness to him. So they're, they're seeing this, and it's just, you know, it never rains. This guy's crazy. Right. It, it just, it's never clicking, you right. know. So it's, that's, that's, what I, that's what I think was going on. With, Good. With I'm going to help dig in a little bit more. Okay. I'm glad you're working with that. I'm glad you're working with that. Uh, Brother Mac, uh, and, and hold on, my sister back there. What's your name, sis? Ebony. Ebony. Go ahead on. Where, how, just... Think it through with me. Yeah, no, initially I was going to say I couldn't imagine what the naysayers were thinking from their point of view, but I actually can. Of course you can, <laughs> and everybody should be able, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I, I can tell you we don't think deeply enough. We have to be able to think deeply enough, because no text of scripture is ever not relevant to where you are right now. No text of scripture. And whatever the players are in that narrative, we want to understand those players. Like we're going to learn on Sunday about Cain and Abel. We're going to go deep into that relationship because Jesus told us to love our enemies, didn't he? Yes. All right. So we can't be. And this is what I really believe is the problem with Christians today. We don't take our Christianity nowhere near as serious enough so that we don't see our Christianity on a day to day basis. We don't see these texts having direct application to us or indirect or remote application to us. We don't see it in other people's lives because we live in such a bubble and such a, a such a narrow, shallow uh, sense of self-reflection or depth. Or maybe we're just not going through. We're not manifesting the level of obvious arc revelation that Noah did. That revelation was uh, conspicuous, wasn't it? So it had to merit some levels of opposition, didn't it? All right, so go ahead on, sis. So what I was going to say is that um, most people have itching ears, 
and they want to listen to the types of gospel that appeal to them to not make them feel wrong and they're distracted by other things in the world you know that make them feel okay like i still go to church it might be new age church but i still go to church and what i believe is right because that's what the crowd believes and they're okay and they're successful and they have um, all the wonders of the world at their fingertips, so they must be doing something right. So people are just distracted, and yep. then they're thinking that the few foolish people that are doing right are just foolish, and they're going with the crowd, and they just believe what everyone else believes. So that's, you know, they're, they're just on the popular opinion. That's the broad path. That's what she's describing. And what's sad about that is she's describing church folk. That's the broad path. She's describing church people that are comfortable with the broad path and are embarrassed about the narrow path. And it makes sense. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? It, it makes sense. It makes sense. Thank you for that, sis. Um, you have the mic, yeah. Um, oh, Alisa. I grew up wanting to be in the Adams family. Mm -hmm. They were my family. Yeah. And I've recently woken up and... I can totally relate to all those people out there. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that they can't. So people are like, I can't believe they don't understand. I can't. I totally get it. I was asleep that whole entire time. Right. And worshiping things and idols, false idols. And, and I take my faith really seriously. And I am very challenged on a day-to-day -day basis because I just don't want to be with anyone. And I feel like I can't talk to people because they look at me, feel like, I feel like I'm crazy. Like I told two friends today, I want nothing to do with you if you don't stop abusing your children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me, one knew, and the other one was about to leave. And I said, you know what? I, I just really can't take it anymore with these kids, what, they're, what people are doing to these kids. They're targeting the kids. And... I feel like I let a lot of stuff happen to my kids and you know my mom did the best she could she had 10 kids mm -hmm. but a lot of stuff still happened yeah yeah especially being raised a Catholic I mean we we're the Catholics that went to church every you know Sunday but my dad was nowhere around right and you know we we just grew up in that and but I think most people are in there and they put the pretty bow on it they make it look good. I mean, we're always clean and shiny, but we are just so jacked up. Yep. yep. And, you know, half my family's jacked up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're all jacked up still, but. <laughs> and um, it, it just, I think most of the people are like that. And that's why it's, to hear the reality of what's going on, you have to be ready and you have to be with God. And I sometimes I feel like I'm crazy, but. I got it. I'll, I'll unravel some of that because what she's doing is talking about what can be understood as the parameters of different aspects of the experience of both being a Christian as well as being on that side of the group of them that were uh, consistently against Christ. Does that make some sense? So like there's an element of the world system. I'll get you in a second, Jashana. All ladies first. As an element of the, uh, the, the narrative that we're talking about, that, that God really didn't get into that part in the Genesis 6 narrative. The part that God got into in the Genesis 6 narrative is the aggressive, violent, hostile, overtly uh, fleshly behavior of the of, of the um, aggregate whole of the group, not people who maybe have been ambivalent, uh, are, are people who may have been waffling. What God looked at was that sense that that element of power that had the audacity to corrupt people and engage in corruption at the level of atrocity that would have included. Uh, it would have included killing children, advocating abortion because that's violence, uh, extortion, fraud, uh, um, uh, tyranny. You, you guys understand what I'm getting at? Because that's what was going on in Genesis 6. 
So society ultimately does that. It, it actually degrades into a kind of mobbish collective whole uh, because the tyrannical powers are creating policies that force most people to engage in that. That's what we're starting to experience. I know your eyes may not be open to it. It should, but if God opened our eyes, some of our passivity is complicity to evil. And we don't want to admit that. Some of our passivity is, pro, is, is complicity to the evil of the children in the womb. And now with some of this stuff that's going on, that's much more overt in terms of the present agenda. People are vacillating because they don't have what Noah had. OK, so so it's, in, it's important to know that uh, it's important to presuppose also. That as Noah strove to sustain a missional position, he wasn't going tit for tat with them, but he wasn't compromising either. He wasn't saying it was all right. He was saying it's not all right. What you are doing is not all right. And you need Christ. Isn't that what it was looking like? Jashana. Um, in regard. You got to get up because we can't hear you. In regard to um, what Noah went through, um, first I would say that he had to have, God had to give him a ton of grace um, because the vitriol of the world around him had to be huge and directed solely at him. Um, I see that from in my environment when I get on like Twitter and you look at people who post things that are godly and then you look at the comments and it's so nasty and horrible. Um, at my job when I, I did things with uh, vax exemptions for the religious um, and I mean, everything's virtual, and I didn't. I wasn't like, oh, I'm a Christian, but when we had our group meetings, the the supervisors, it was so disgusting. Yep. I mean, like the policy at work is diversity and inclusion, and tolerance, and having a safe space. You know, that's what everybody's trained. But when you're in the meeting, you know. These people, these Christians are crazy. Yep. Do they really believe that this is the sign of the, I mean, it was, I was just, I'm, I was, and what, it, what, what I'm saying about Noah is for me, it made me shrink. That's right. I'm it's intimidating. It's you're, intimidating. You're, right. It's, it's super intimidating. intimidating. Yep. And, and I, it, he had to have a ton of grace because it's hard. And, I, and what it makes me realize that, I, Lord, I, my confession lately to the Lord is, Lord, I'm scary. Mm -hmm. I am scary. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to do anything or be a witness, you're going to have to strengthen me to do that. Like in that situation, all I could do was click accept, accept, accept as, as much as I could. That was what was given to me. I That's said, I'll work as much overtime I, as I can to help people get what they need to get because most of these people are clicking deny 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 that's exactly right okay that's exactly um, right the same thing with friends and i've had some god has given me some but i he he had to deal with that and then on the flip side the people who see the witness i don't know what's going on in their heart but i i've seen it with friends and family it, it's just a heartening yep. and it's an attack yep. and it's a nastiness yep. that, that comes out of them. That's, that's, I just said, I was like, are you guys crazy? Is it, is something wrong with you? And, and yeah, it is. And, and I just think of Romans one. Of course. Romans one. You, the great, great way to put it. Um, who has the mic now? Who has the mic? Okay, so I'm going to start with a few gentlemen, and then we can get the mic back to our ladies. We're going to do about six more. Um, uh, uh, David. Okay. Um, I'll start with Noah. Um, Noah loved his neighbor as himself, and so I'm sure he must have looked around at all the people around him 
and experienced a massive amount of sadness and and frustration that no one no one could could understand that he he had he had something real that's that's Noah uh, now that's your perception of Noah right right and it's okay right. hold on it's okay because what I want you to be able to do is understand the spectrum of human experience right. when I'm asking you to share you're sharing what you could easily recognize would be a particular characteristic trait of a believer under those difficult circumstances I right. would agree with that right uh, now we'll talk about the neighbors um, the neighbors would have been a little curious. I mean, what's this guy's doing? What, what's he building? They'd be a little curious. Um, and then many, mo a lot of them, most of them probably would have been disgusted uh, and just would have written him off as a, as a nutcase. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Okay, good. That, good. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to force it deeper before we go. You know I'm going to do that. And the reason why. It's because our text really tells us how to be thinking about this. But what we're doing right now is actually talking from our experience. So David did that. The last thing I would believe is that they were just curious for 100 years. See, the thing that I'm pressing home to you guys is that evil gets worse and worse and worse. That's what it does. It doesn't just stay neutral. Sandy. That was one of my points bringing up here is in Romans where uh, God gave them over to a reprobate mind in chapter 1. And uh, God told Noah that he was done with them. And so I thought Noah was extremely wise because his wisdom was the fear of God. He had the godly fear. And he was obedient to God, and he kept building up. He kept on. He never stopped. And the family that he took on the ark, uh, they didn't get invited to birthday parties. He had the daughters-in-law, so, so they were shunned by family. This is my opinion. Of course. And the other thing is Noah didn't even know he was trusting God. They didn't even know what rain was. It had never rained. So you got to think about what you just said. So because I'm a teacher, I can't let you make that proposition because it okay. wouldn't make any sense. We always know we're trusting God. We always know we're trusting God. So you can you can reframe that. I don't even remember what I said. Now. That's what I thought. I no, I, the trusting God was on Noah's part. But That's you what said, I was talking about. did you guys hear? Her? She said Noah didn't know he was trusting God. No, no, no. Noah didn't know what rain was. That's what I was saying. Oh, well, I was saying, anyway, the people didn't know what rain was. I mean... Well, nobody knew at all what... The, the judgment. Right. Exactly. And that was the, my, my point, that God had already decided and judgment was coming. And then it comes back to uh, Revelations, what you just taught us last... Uh, when we were in Revelations where he said, he who is unjust, let him keep yep. the unjust still. And he who is filthy, Definitely. let him be filthy Definitely. still. And so they were stuck in that window. You guys remember, remember me talking about being stuck in that window of time where the, once you get past a certain time, there is no redemption. You're just locked in the window of condemnation. And what that would mean is you would just live in a state of unrepentance unregeneracy, uh, hardness of heart, all kind of qualities can be thought about now that emerge when a person is locked into a hundred years. Now again, remember we extrapolated that because men and women live to be seven or eight hundred years. So it'd be, we could reduce that down to a 10 year period for people who live 70 or 80 or 90 years, right? It's a long period of time in what is called a window of tribulation where there is no repentance. And so that, that would make sense. And um, the, last, the last point on that was when Noah got on the uh, ark, they shut the door. Mm -hmm. This is when the people would have wanted to come in, and it was done, done. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's well, good. It's yes, good. It yes, makes yes. the same thing. It's okay. It makes, it, it makes the same sense, and you're absolutely right. Now, I would say this about that little piece, and this is what we will ultimately discover. Yeah. Um, 
it's possible that they would have never even had a chance to get to the door. Okay, that is to be worked out. And that's the sad thing about it. Not get to the door or not know the door was there. To go to Any the of that. Mm-hmm. Right, because see if you... All right, so I'm going to take a few more questions before I sum it up with some ideas. Carissa. Okay, so what I got is like being born again. You trust in the Lord no matter what. And people around you don't. You get family members, you get friends, you get people that you know, you get strangers that don't. But the trust that you have in the Lord in spreading the gospel, it doesn't affect them. And for me, it was like, okay, I'm all by myself because all these people, they don't believe, they don't believe. And the things that they say to me, and it's it's like they're just trying to put a crack in my armor Mm -hmm. with the stuff that they say and the stones that they throw and all that. Sure. And so I can get where Noah trusted in the Lord because when the Lord comes upon you, that spirit allows you to do that. And God gave him the strength to get the hits and the snares and the you're crazy and this and that. And he probably did see a couple of people that would stand and watch and listen, but wouldn't take that step because of everybody else. All of that. Very good. Gary. I, excuse me. I, as looking at Noah and the people that were God, gave them a hundred years to come to him. And I, as a pendulum that was swinging left to right towards God, I knew God existed, but I chose not to accept God. Exactly. His existence. Yeah. It took like the hundred years that it took Noah to me to build the ark. Every soul that perished had a choice to make to choose to help build that ark or perish and they knew it they chose not to accept it Mm -hmm. and i knew because god was calling me throughout my life Mm -hmm. and i was being disobedient i was out there in the world i was doing you name it i did it right and now i i i don't regret i'm glad that i went through it because it taught me how important god actually is in my life yeah now yeah and without that experience or that butt whooping, yes. as you put it, yep. I would have still been over there with those who chose That's right. Not. I agree. I agree. Anybody else? Did we have somebody else with the mic? My sister, tell us your name again. You can, you can start. You can go. go. Wait, wait, wait. All right, y'all being Christian-y. Just come on. Come on. We got it for okay. time's sake. Tell us your name. Um, Anna. Anna, that's right. Is it okay if I just share got, scripture you, that came to mind? Just yeah, you can share a scripture that okay. came to mind, but you so got to keep the mic to you. To okay, mind. I just want to say how amazed I was just considering after you mentioned it, how the grace of God is, is displayed and demonstrated through the men and women of God in the Bible and also in us. But specifically how you referenced, you know, in that 100 years, God gave Noah grace in order for him to believe. Yeah. And so that grace... Just, just to consider that 100 years. And then also, you know, just as in Paul, just as in David, just as in Peter, we see, we see Noah's humanity. He steps off the ark and then he grows a vineyard. Yep. And then he drinks wine. Yep. You know, just to see the grace of God, to see the power of God, to yep. see the sovereignty of God in and through us. Um, I'm just amazed at that. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, um, I apologize. I just lost it. I was trying to write all the scriptures down to save time. But the scripture that references all these things happened. That's right. For as our, examples. Yes. Yep. Examples. That's first so Corinthians that 10. So that we wouldn't lust after evil things as Absolutely. they did also. Absolutely. Yep. And so I wanted to um, pull that scripture out as God reminded me of it. And also everyone's reference to Romans chapter one. I just want to read verse 18 for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness 
because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. So we know that God used Noah and his family to show it unto them, his Absolutely. righteousness, even though they did not hold to it or believe it. Right. Or, you know, right. um, obviously they weren't given the grace also, the same grace that Noah was given, they weren't given. Um, in reference to Noah's, it also reminds me in Hebrews 11, all those patriarchs of faith and women of faith, um, they held on to the promise of God, even though they died not having received it, even right. though they died having not the manifestation of God's promise. And right. so obviously Noah was mentioned as you read. Um, there's, there's so many more scriptures. All right, so you can't quote those, because that's for you. So I'm gonna help you with a rule. I'm gonna help you help all of you guys. And, and it's just love for community. Mm -hmm. So you, when, you're, when you're being taught, if you are prolific in your capacity to get these revelations, and I do, anybody, anytime anybody teaches, I get a flood of revelations. Mm -hmm. They're for you first. Mm -hmm. And you'll recognize that it's not economically feasible to quote them all publicly, because right, right. they're for you. Right, yeah. right. Okay, so only one or two are needed because we know our Bibles as well, right. and you are giving some good scripture in reference to the life of the believer. Right. Can All I right. give just a, a couple more? So in reference to Noah and his family, what it must have been for them was Philippians 121, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And also just their obedience unto God, you know, being a sweet saver, but death unto the unbelievers. Very much so. Um, so you time Bible verses together, that's good. My sister, did you have an officer? We'll get you, we'll close with you, Matt. Go on, ladies first. Yes. Very um, good, Anna. Uh, my name is May. May. And um, so what everybody said, really, I could really piggyback on. But one of the things, just starting with the neighbors, that I, I thought about is, I mean, it's very similar to what, well, what you said. Like you said, teaching revelation, when you talked about the narrow road versus the wide. Um, and I just thought about those people, and even myself, you know, in unbelief, that sometimes it's easier to stand with the group. Yep as opposed to alone yeah and 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 also it gives you this false sense that you're right yep. <laughs> because everybody believe this right 100 percent um and so uh, that was one observation yes. about the people but then I, and I thought about no and i was like man you know he was building this ark for that time he stood alone what was his motivation? Now we know it's the grace of God, yeah, you know, with, yeah. that's what it was. But just as a as a human, just right. thinking about what was it that kept him going and building all of this time, um, not ever experiencing rain and so forth. And what I was thinking about is just how, like, God in my life, like, if He's told me something that. Uh, well, anytime God tells me something, it's beyond me. But you know, He tells me something, and I have to do it in faith. Sometimes what keeps me growing in faith and keep me going is to see little aspects of that revelation revealed. And so when I think of Noah building plank by plank, like you said, you know, him just getting that word from God, God giving him kind of the, I think the dimensions, I think God may have given him as well, and seeing that start to build and come up and seeing the grandeur of kind of this thing that God told him kind of come to life right before his very eyes. Yes. Might have even been, you know, even even rationalizing, well, God, you told me about this wonderful thing that or this awesome thing that I've never seen, I can't really comprehend, but now I'm starting to see as I followed your instruction how it's possible. You that's, know what I mean? And I just that, think that that probably maybe encouraged him to kind of like keep going being the only one, you know. No, good job. Those people. Good job. This is why I called it an arc of revelation. I framed it that way because what you need to know is when you actually follow God, God confirms you in his work. That's why I framed it that way. So it would have been uh, unbearable had Noah been laboring for 100 years and not making any progress. So for the servant of God, what keeps us is that we see the spiritual progress of the ark being built. So, so we can be tempted to look at it from the world's standpoint. But when you're able to keep your eyes on the vision, 
then that sustains you. And that's 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 a discipline of the mind to prioritize yourself around the objective for which you are called to participate with God in bringing glory to his name around things that are unseen by the evidence of things seen. So as that ark began to expand, Noah's confidence grew only in the context that God is getting his work done in spite of opposition, in spite of hostility, in spite of betrayal. Does that make some sense? Right. And I have taught before uh, around this that there are a couple of other licenses that could have taken place. License meaning I could read into it with, with legitimate plausibility that this enterprise which is really a call to build God's church. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel, which started in a small place in Jerusalem. Then it went to uh, Judah. Then it went to Samaria. Then it went to the uttermost parts of the world. The ark is still in building. Can y'all see that? Right. And so when a believer has enough experience of the material manifestation of the church or of the ark of the gospel, including not only my time, like I have the confidence and the comfort of church history. Like I'm not just connected to today. I'm connected to a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, a thousand years ago, because we're all part of one unified body. See, God has his own singularity too. He got his own blockchain. He got his own one language. He's got his own one people. Is one God, is one Lord, is one Christ, is one spirit, is one body working together to build that ark revelation of the glory of God in Christ. That is the comfort of a Noah type individual for us. We are not, we don't lose sight of that reality and it brings us joy. And we're not into a numbers game. I'm not, Pastor Jesse is not. Our numbers don't even even bother me when I am clear on who God is. When I'm clear on who God is, it's not about numbers. So I, don't, I try never to get uh, swayed one way or the other. If a bunch of people believe what I say, fine. If hardly no one believes what I say, if I'm telling the truth, my comfort comes in that God graced me to tell the truth. To tell the truth, because that that is the perseverance of the saints in that context. Does that make some sense? That's what Noah had to do. Noah had to go out the house every day and realize he's making advancement in the grace of God. And he probably had a bunch of people that he hired to help him because God would have allowed anybody to help. He had allowed anybody to help. You know that because the nature of any of God's corporate ministry included unbelievers. It included hypocrites. It included church folk. He had allowed anybody to help. Because he, he would have wanted them to touch the gospel, taste the gospel, smell the wood, the old gopher wood, see the badger skin, see the ram skin. But because they had no desire for the reality behind the symbol, they would have left off with him sometime and then turned around and vandalized the gospel. And then Noah and his family and whoever else was with him in that journey would have had to just clean it up because sometimes we clean it up mess. Church is a messy business. Do you understand what I just stated? It's a messy business, but it always goes forward. It's always progressing. Very good, very good. Are we done with our sisters? Can Let I me just, see. Can I just say one thing about the 100 years? It's kind of like what we're going through right now of all this. And I don't want to sound like a downer, but I get excited when I hear about the truckers, the Canadian truckers. But then I hear some kind of stuff going, oh, it's going to be over with now. And I just really feel that we just have to keep praying and not think it's going to be over in a week or two weeks. And or it's definitely not going to be over in a week or two weeks. Right. But what you want to be able to do is see progress made right. by people standing up for reality, truth and freedom, because the gospel is, is, is designed to flourish in the context of freedom. This is really a gospel issue. People don't want to know it, but it really is a gospel issue of not only losing the gospel and losing, but losing our freedoms. 
which gospel men and women died for. See, gospel men and women died for the freedom that this country had. And this country has done just like national Israel, abandoned the God that liberated them from the tyranny of King George to come over here and establish a gospel experience where men and women on the grounds of freedom can worship God freely and truly. We have abandoned God. Now we're experiencing the abandonment. And we're learning how to live with that because as we stated, that hundred year period was God giving them up. Right? God giving them up and yet we still are preaching because we don't know who God's elect are. And they're going to be coming in like for me, it's been 40 years. And I've heard people say the world was going in back in 1994. I was all part of all that. It's going in that two, Y2K, 2000, right? Right. I've heard all that old crap and God's still building his church. Still building his church. And that's why Noah kept on. He went out. He said, man, we're making some progress, Lord. The boat was twice this room size. Do you understand that? Can you imagine him going in there, just running around, touching everything? Because he built all kind of compartments for the different animals and the, all kind of stuff was going on. The vision was coming to pass. Right? He had revelations and they were coming to pass. And so that's the secret joy of the believer in the midst of so much unbelief. So we live, we sow our seed in sorrow. We reap in joy. Right, that's what we're doing, Brother Matt. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to start with uh, Kyle in the back, and then we'll close with Brother Matt. Uh, yeah, thank you, Pastor Jesse. Um, uh, my thought, because uh, I was thinking about the people that, um, what they would have been thinking in um, seeing Noah building the ark, and your comment about how evil continues to... Uh, about exactly yes. um and so i my thought was um that their response internally uh, could have even been um to get to want to get noah and his family to either recant or compromise uh, because it seems like the world is, in, uh, well, even in the, in when we've talked about, or when you've shared about like Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot, the, the goal of the world is to penetrate into the church and get it to, to compromise and yes. to, um, or if they, if they can't get you to compromise, then they just want to destroy you totally. Absolute, absolutely. And, um, and, uh, I was thinking in history, like, um, about like Martin Luther when he, went up against the Catholic Church and then how the Catholic Church, the Pope and the bishops and everyone came around and tried to get him to recant sure. and to stop or sure. or even in today's day and age, I think about um, like the underground church in China where um, the government has gone into the churches and put up, you know, they have the, the paintings of Mao or the paintings of Xi Jinping and they try to get the pastors to recant and if they if they don't, then you are an enemy of the state, sure. and the church has gone underground. Sure, but they're growing. That's right. You know, they continue to to expand um, under that because they're you know like like the Noah. They're like kind of the Noah type in that where they're not giving up on the true faith. I guess. No, that's if good. That makes sense. No, that's good. That that's good. What you what you should know that I'm really provoking you to be is aware of church history. That's what I'm provoking you to be, aware of church history, because it's apparent that we're not, and, and the suffering church. That's what I'm really provoking you to do. That's why I stated, when you have enough working knowledge of history, you see yourself as being in a line of men and women who have suffered because they stood for Christ. And people that don't see themselves in that lineage can't imagine bearing up under suffering for Christ. And that has been cut off for Americans, largely. So in a lot of ways in which the American experiment cut off African-Americans from their African culture, and it did have some impact. It did have some impact. So American tradition 
with suffering as pilgrims and, and gospel men and women has been lost on the church in this generation as well. So the church in my generation does not identify with our brothers and sisters in Korea or our brothers and sisters in China or our brothers and sisters in any of the Muslim countries that, that are going through what they're going through. So many scenarios that time would not allow but we don't connect with them because we are part of a very materialistic dimension of Christianity that has bought into the lie that uh, we can have Christ in the world too. And once the world is doing what it's doing, gradually turning against all things biblical, and that's what it's doing. It hasn't made a direct attack on us as Christians. It has made a indirect attack on us in terms of the morals and ethics that we hold to. So when when shallow minded secularists ask me, how is it that we're, we're we're attacking the church? And I say it's only in this regard that you are attacking the name of the one true and living God who is holy. And he has called all humanity to holiness because we are created in the Imago Dei. Amen. So the moment that you kill, you are attacking the Christian, whether you kill in the womb or kill out of the womb, you are attacking the Christian because you are attacking the Imago Dei that we support. So the Christian really is supporting all humanity in that we are supporting the ideal humanity in Jesus Christ. Y'all got that? In a lot of ways, we are supporting people who are going through the tyranny that don't even know that the tyranny that they're going through, they are under and we are supporting them. When we support freedom, we are supporting people's opportunity to actually be saved. And so when you don't think in, t in those terms, you're operating in a very narrow minded, selfish lens. OK, so this is why Jesus said, love your what? Enemies. enemies. That's what Noah was doing. That's what David said every day. Noah was loving his enemies in that he was giving them an avenue into an escape from the judgment that was coming. And every time we obey God, that's exactly what we're doing. Loving our enemies. We're loving our enemies. And, and, and when we love our enemies with a proper knowledge of who God is in his character and attributes, we don't want theft. We don't want fraud. We don't want false witnessing. We don't want tyranny. We don't want slavery. We don't want murder. We don't want adultery. We don't want fornication. We don't want homosexuality. We don't want a uh, misdefining of our nature. We don't want to destroy the binary distinction between men and women. We don't want to cross boundaries and be bitten by the serpent. I don't want to be bit by the serpent and I don't want nobody else to be bit by the serpent. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Right. So if I love my neighbor as myself, I'm going to try to get all the snakes out of his yard because if I don't, they're going to come over to my yard. And I don't want no snakes in my yard. Right. So what, what we don't often understand as Christians, that when we are being the best Christians we can, we care about everybody. So I'm going to let Brother Mac finish because it's time and then we're going to close out. What's your thoughts, my brother? Well, it seems like they've already been said, mm -hmm. but the grace to believe. We definitely need that. Yeah. I believe that grace to believe on Noah and his family was very heavy. Yeah. He had a, a, the capacity to keep his ears and eyes on God and a grace to bear witness. I think that piggybacks on grace to believe. Yes, sir. It's a piggyback there. Yeah. Grace to their suffering is a piggyback on one and two yeah. of our uh, brief there. Now, those people, I was sitting here and I got a thought of John 7, where Jesus came and he was talking to the people. And we found out in John 7 that there was some fear. Yeah. So as humans, I believe those people in Noah's day, they were fearful. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that could could have kept them from following no one hundred percent deals one hundred percent yeah we get it don't human, we we get it we are right human. right and we, we get are it living mm -hmm. in a day when fear is high huge 
but I thank God that we are looking at the Nephilim. Yes. The Nephil. Yep. And see, we don't know who we're fooling with uh -huh. when we're fooling with God, <laughs> especially the ungodly. That's right. They're going to be left in their sin. Yes, they will. And it grieves me yep. that they had a chance. That's right. But we know God has an elect. Yep. And he's going to do what he's going to do. Um, those people, there's nothing new under the sun. Those people are with us today on our jobs, in our homes, yep. in our churches. Yep. They're everywhere. Everywhere. The police department, yep. the fire department. Yep. But there's still a chance. Yes. Just like you said, we're still able to preach the gospel. God has given us grace to do it. Yep. And so, regardless of what happened, we're winners. I feel like the battle is already over. There we go. In the mind yeah. of God. Yeah, yeah. And we get a chance to think his thoughts after him. That's right. That's right. The imagination. Yeah. Yeah. God fixed it where we could do what he could do. That's right. In a reasonable sense. That's right. The attributes. That's right. The imagination. Yeah. That's a strong thing now. That's a strong thing. The imagination. Mm -hmm. Now, this is how we're going to close. We're done. I'm going to show you this because I want you to capture it. So what Noah did was point to Christ by his life. Y'all see that? And then pointing to Christ, yeah, bring all those mics up, they cost $400 a piece. <laughs> what he said to those people was, now God's going to punish all sin. That's what he was saying. God's going to punish all sin. That's what he was saying. You got to know that. Because God had told him. All the, the end of all flesh has come before me. That's a gospel tenet. The wages of sin is what? So, so Noah believed that. And he also believed in the substitutionary atoning work of a person who could bear all that sin in himself in the person of the Lord Jesus. So I want you to get this. This is where we're going. Noah had the benefit of knowing the difference between bearing the wrath of God on oneself outside of Christ versus, versus bearing the wrath of God inside of Christ. He believed in bearing the wrath of God in Christ. Because everybody ended up at the same place. The judgment. Did y'all get that? We all going to the same place. But some people are going to have an ark of a covering. And others won't. And the difference is believing and living like that. And for those of us who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we know that so. That if God were to pour his wrath down on this world right now, at this very second, those of us who are trusting Christ are in the ark right now. Does that make some sense? Does that make some sense? Yeah, you need to think this through. Please, child of God, because when you, that was Noah's secret. That was his secret. That's what gave him grace to persevere, to be in Christ, to be in Christ, allowed him to face the judgment. And that's what we have to understand. And, and that's a love to humanity because ain't nobody escaping except in Christ. All right, Father, thank you for your mercy and kindness as we get ready to go our way. Give us traveling mercies. Help us to think through the beauty of your word, be able to live on the promises of your son and understand we're still human, that we are a work in progress. 
And we need grace every day of our life. Thank you for all these folks that have come out. Give them traveling mercy. Bless their homes, Lord. Help us to continue in the same grace you gave Noah. Help us to continue in that grace. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. I need a couple guys help me bring down my uh, chalkboard. We're going to do it over here, fellas. Yeah. So are you, are, can you catch that side for me? And then just in the middle, if you two grab it in the middle, bring it out, bring it out and get on the stairs. And, and we got it. Me and Steve got it.